My name is Alex Caserta. I recently retired from a 34-year career as a visual arts instructor in order to embark on a new adventure. As a photographer, my goal is to reveal historical information while shedding new light on the people and places that sustain our rich cultural heritage. This is an opportunity for us to discover the farms, food, and flavors of our beautiful state. This is a time for us to explore the diverse wonders in our own backyard. This is Harvesting Rhode Island. <laughs> it's a wrap! <laughs> I'm uh, in Narragansett Bay. It's a beautiful morning. I'm here with Steve DiPetrillo from Allen Harbor Oyster Company. And we're heading out to a cove where he has uh, his oyster beds. Steve, it's beautiful out today. Yeah, it's, uh, it's nice despite the uh, temperature. Yeah, just a little cool. <laughs> it, it's, it's beautiful out here no matter what the season is, but it, a little more enjoyable doing this in the summer. Yeah. So how long have you been doing this, Steve? I've had the farm for about nine years. Nine years. And you have a partner. I have a partner, Andrew Smiley. And uh, do you have any other workers who are working with you? Yeah, we have uh, Andrew Jr. and Andrew the third. I'm sorry, his son and Chris. You're all working together in the cove, basically? Yeah, we're all on the farm working together. OK, and then from the farm, you you bring your daily catch on shore where you sort? Uh, we sort it out on the farm. We actually stand in the water. We do wade in and do all our work standing in the water right now. Uh, it's a little easier that way. You get, get more hands on than pulling up into the boat, which uh, isn't as precise. Uh, we uh, sort them, grade them, and then uh, package them and uh, put them on ice, and then we take them to sell. And how many oysters do you uh, harvest on a daily basis? Well, uh, on a weekly basis, we're harvesting about 6,000 a week right now. 6,000? Yeah. That's we're, quite we're, a bit. Yeah, it is. We're, we're a small farm. We're two acres. We're really kind of a mom and pop uh, kind of family farm type operation. There's, there's much larger farms in the salt ponds and, and in the bay. But uh, we, we, we manage our two acres and, and we get a pretty good productivity out of it. Now, do you have plans or hopes for expanding? Uh, yeah, we, we'd probably in the future like to expand. I mean, only maybe another acre or half acre because we're, we're, we're doing uh, uh, intense farming the way we're doing it. And so we're not even utilizing our whole two acres yet. But, uh, we're trying to maximize every inch of it because, uh, you know, it's kind of like a precious thing to bay. It belongs to everybody in Rhode Island. And uh, we've been fortunate enough to be able to get this lease of two acres. And we feel that uh, it's our duty to, to get the best out of it. Yeah, that's a nice way of looking at it in terms of sustainability of, exactly. of the bay and uh, taking care of the bay. And that's what we feel we are uh, in our little way. Each oyster filters 50 gallons of water a day, each adult oyster clean. And uh, our, we grow our oysters in bags and cages, as you'll see. And those cages provide habitat for juvenile fish, striped bass, flounder, uh, every now and then a little lobster. And it keeps it protects them from predators. You know, they can go in and out of the cages. There's a lot of benefits to oyster farming. You mentioned that you're working on a project to develop a reef? Yeah, we're, we're working in cooperation with the Natural Resource and Conservation Service, uh, building a, a self-sustaining oyster reef. Uh, years ago, there were oyster reefs all around here, and an oyster reef is an accumulation of oysters that spawn, and, and more oysters stick to them, and they grow, and eventually they come to the surface. But what they also do is every time they spawn, there are at least uh, millions of oyster seed, oyster spat into the water, and they go around the bay and they stick to different places. And that's why this bay was once a, a huge producer of oysters. But it's, uh, it's, it's become depleted uh, through man and nature, actually. And uh, this, this project is, is, is trying to bring that back. 
How large would the uh, oyster reef be? Uh, we're working on a tenth of an acre, actually. A tenth of an acre. It's a four-year project uh, where we, uh, we deposit a bed of shell, and then on top of that, we deposit uh, oyster shell with, with juvenile oysters attached to it uh, that we've got for hatchery. And we, we put that on top of the shell. And that basically uh, should go off on its own. You know, the oysters grow, and then they spit out baby oysters, and they stick and grow. And it'll be something that perpetuates itself. So it's basically a way of uh, building up an oyster population in the bay by having a reef. Right, right. And, and having that produce for it, the it, fishermen. It, it also, if the, uh, it will clean up the water in that area. Ours, we're building ours in Bissell Cove, which is south of here, near Whitford. And then, uh, like I said, the oy oysters take nitrogen out of the water, which uh, nitrogen causes algae blooms, and, and uh, which depletes the oxygen in the water, and then the fish die. And then oyster, oyster takes uh, so much uh, of its weight in nitrogen uh, and converts it into food, basically. Do you have any idea of where your oysters go in terms of locations outside of Rhode Island? Yeah, they, they're being sold in Chicago, Atlanta, New York City. Uh, they're, they're pretty much loved everywhere. It's yeah, a great oyster. They're advertised as Rhode Island oysters? Yep, they're advertised as Hope Islands. That's our, We call our oysters Hope Island Hope oysters. Hope Island, okay. Co company is Allen Harbor Oyster Company, but we've named our oysters the Hope Island. I mean, you can see Hope Island out there in the distance. And, uh, it's nice. Yeah, it has, you know, it has to do with Rhode Island, uh, the motto Hope. You know, the anchor that yep. we have as our logo. This is really something that, you know, it's something from Rhode Island that's good that the yeah. people are seeing, you know. <laughs> that's right. And, it, and it's being spread throughout the country. Almost, yeah, yeah. Which is very nice. It's, it's, uh, uh, we because, warned for Andrew and me to see that our oysters are, you know, in a French restaurant in New York City. And, uh, in a fancy restaurant in Chicago. You went to school and you have a degree in biology. Yeah, I have a degree in biology. So I'm sure that must um, help in some way in terms of what you're doing? Well, it does, but it, actually uh, more of my 40 years as a quag on the bay, I think that that's what helps me. Same thing with Andrew. Andrew's been a fisherman. Uh, he's done a lot of other things, but he loves the water like I do. and. Uh, I think what we've learned hands-on working the bay is what we uh, put to use in, this, in the farm. Okay, so what do you call these? Uh, Those are chest waders, insulated chest waders. Insulated chest waders. They'll keep you warm and dry and make you tired from walking around. I'm walking gonna, around, I'm getting. I don't know if. It's, yeah, that's the right foot. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Well, wait a minute, let me see. Oh, this is the back. Yeah, that's the back. You gotta even walk backwards. Common mistake. <laughs> Pocket up front. Okay. Sit down and then kind of slip off. There you go. All right. Come on over and meet the boys. Okay, Steve, give me an explanation of what we're doing here, uh, standing uh, in Narragansett Bay. Um, what do you call these things that uh, Drew's scraping off? Drew's scraping off sea lettuce. Sea off lettuce? The bags and, uh, it, it, it fouls the bags and it prevents good water flow for the oysters. And okay, and what are these made out of, these bags? They're called ADPI bags. They're made out of plastic. Made out of plastic. And how many of these bags do we have in the water? 1,200. 
Uh, you have them in uh, uh, some sort of a trap system. Cages. Cages. Hopefully the next time we look at them, they'll be big enough to sell. Okay, and how, how large will these actually get if you let them stay in the water? They'll, they'll, they'll grow as big as your foot. No kidding? Yeah. But you don't want them that big. Um, uh, no, they would be, what, tender at? Uh, well, the, hey, the public doesn't want them that big. The, the, maybe somebody really wants an oyster that big, but the, generally the oyster eating public, they like something three inches. This particular type of oyster, what's it called? It's uh, the Virginia oyster. Virginia oyster. And does it actually come from Virginia, or is it? Oh, no. These oysters, uh, they were spawned in uh, Fish Fishers Island, New York, uh, hatch at a hatchery. At a hatchery. All right. Then you, how does the process work? Uh, we, we order them, and we uh, pick them up, and then we br bring them uh, to the farm when they're no bigger than your baby fingernail. And we put them in uh, progressively larger mesh bags as they grow. They start out in a very much smaller mesh bag than this. And then as they get bigger, we increase the mesh size. And that's part of the work. It's, it's constantly uh, separating them as they grow. So it's very hands-on type of production all the time. Very hands-on. Got a little crab over there walking around. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's extra. That's extra. <laughs> I think he's too small to eat. Yeah. Ciao. <laughs> and what's the transition period like in terms of the actual time that it'll get from the water here to get on somebody's plate? Two days. Two, two days. days. That's remarkable. That's, I mean, we, we take them down to the distributor and make them where, where do you say you said them? Uh, the Chicago, Atlanta, New York City. Boston. 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 The, the key is uh, serving them. Fresh. fresh. Fresh, yes. Fresh out of the farm, farm to table. Right, farm to table movement, yeah. even with the oyster farming. Definitely, yes. Not on the land, but we're in the water and it's a whole different process. Now, what, what part of the day will you uh, spend here working in the water? We, we go by the tide. Tide come in, comes in and uh, it gets to a certain point on our waders. Hope, you know, we don't want to go up this side, right. so. We gotta get out of here, you know, before we get wet. You ready to do the shake? Oh, yeah. Look at that shaking action. And tell me about the shaking the process. Shake what is what does that do? Well, the sh the shake breaks off the new growth, new growth along the edge of the oyster. Okay. And when you break that new growth off, it kind of forces the oyster to grow a cup shape instead of growing long and flat. Kind of like a bonsai tree, you know, you manipulate it to be in more uh, suitable for the market. They want a cup shaped oyster, deep cup, and that's what the shaking process does. And it also makes them uh, a little safer. Oysters have very sharp edges. How about you try one? All right, it's, uh, oh. this looks good. Give that a try. What do you think? A little piece of sand, but... That's extra. Yeah, uh, and you can taste the brine. It's, um, it's very buttery. Uh, very fresh, slides down smooth, boy. I'll tell you. It's like uh, taste of the taste of the bay. It's unbelievable. You know, it's like uh, a good day at the beach. It's kind of like the, the, the taste cues you have. When yeah, you go it the doesn't beach. get any fresher than this. It's, it's, it's incredible. Well, thank you. That's what we're working for out here. I'm here with Greg Silks today 
in North Kingstown, and he is the general manager of American Muscle Harvesters. And this is quite an operation that you have here. Thank you. Uh, you say you've been here since 2003 in this facility? That's correct. We moved up here from uh, Point Judith. We were there. Uh, company opened in 1986, and uh, we eventually outgrew the Point Judith location. And uh, this was a prime spot for us to move to uh, because of the location on a working harbor. And it's also a close proximity to Narragansett Bay. Yeah, now you deal with three different types of shellfish, correct? correct. Uh, mussels, oysters, and clams ship daily. That's what we do here. Um, we probably carry about 30 to 40 different varieties of oysters, and uh, we specialize in three or four brands of mussels, and then our nice local quahogs and seamers here from Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island. Okay. And I, I was here, I, I noticed a couple of the local fishermen coming in, yep. bringing the local quahogs in and throwing them up on the pallets. Yep. Uh, you have how many workers? Uh, we have 38 full-time employees. We probably have about 20 or so gentlemen who work out on the processing floor. You tell me that you work with your two brothers. Yes. And all of you have a certain uh, control over an area. You're the general manager of the plant here. Yep. And your brothers do what? My brothers are uh, work on the oyster farming operation. So we have a sister company, Saltwater Farms. Uh, we have three different leases to grow oysters and other shellfish in Narragansett Bay. Uh, two of them actually in Narragansett Bay and one is offshore of Newport. Um, and basically we brand three different oysters from our farm and they're the ones who are out on the water working the gear, cleaning the gear up, harvesting the oysters and bringing it back here to our processing facility. And in terms of processing, what, what do the numbers look like when it, when it comes to uh, numbers of mussels that, that get processed on a daily basis and sure. compared to maybe oysters or quahogs? Sure, uh, mussels are definitely our biggest volume. Um, we probably process 20 to 25,000 pounds of mussels a day. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday, five days a week. So we're over 100,000 pounds processed a week, uh, which is a great number. Um, and then as far as oyster farming, we're on a, any given harvest, we're probably bringing in around 10,000 oysters at a time. Uh, like I said, we market as three different brands and our harvesting is basically dictated by how much we sell. Uh, so in the summer, we're probably harvesting three or four times a week. In the winter, we're maybe two to three times a week. And then the coal hogs just come in as the fishermen are able to go out. That's all dictated by mother nature. Yeah, and when the, uh, when the fresh product comes here to you, it stays fresh. Even, Absolutely. Even when it goes out on the trucks, you have a, a process over here where you bring fresh seawater mm -hmm. into the uh, the tubs or the, the tanks and you uh, keep the uh, products alive and fresh uh, in the water, yep. in the local seawater, and then you process it so it's, it's fairly fresh when it gets to the uh, place where it's going. It's almost as fresh as you can get. The uh, traditional model of harvesting shellfish was you harvest it out of the water, put it in your cooler where it's slowly dying. Uh, what uh, Bill, who the owner and, uh, and, and founder of America Muscle, wanted to do was figure out a way to keep that product as fresh as possible. So he traveled around the world to different countries that uh, work well with mussels and work a lot with mussels and shellfish. We took a bunch of different ideas and what he came up with was a system where we put pump water into the facility, store the shellfish in the water until the day we ship it to the customer. Um, basically, you're keeping the product as fresh as possible, and the sterile the, the seawater is sterilized. So the shellfish, when they're trying to filter food out of the water, there's nothing there, and they're cleansing their gut of sand and grit and bacteria. So you get fresh, clean shellfish delivered to you. So we could process product here uh, for a customer in Chicago, and two days later, via refrigerated truck, he has product fresh out of the ocean on his restaurant menu. That's incredible, and I know that you ship all over the country. Washington DC, mm -hmm. New York City, Boston, yep. out is to the west coast? Yep, or we fly almost? product out to the west coast. We actually have a refrigerated truck that goes as far west as Denver, Colorado. Denver. If you can believe it. It's <laughs> and, amazing. And they're up on the oyster bars uh, and Absolutely. the other bars with uh, little tags saying fresh from Rhode Island. Yeah. And everybody knows what we're doing here in, in terms of seafood products. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I think it's terrific. Great advertising for the state. Well, Rhode Island has some of the best shellfish in the world, and we want to make sure that our name continues to be 
you know, we're, we're proud of Rhode Island, we're proud of our shellfish. We want to continue to get that product out to the world. Now, do you think that um, most of what you process goes out of state? Um, most of it does, but we also have a really nice local following. Uh, when we moved up here to central Rhode Island, uh, we figured that we're kind of in a central location where we could deliver direct to restaurants and retail markets in Boston, uh, Providence, Newport, uh, even down into Hartford, Connecticut, and 95 quarter in Connecticut. So we have a small fleet of vehicles that two to three days a week are in those smaller markets delivering direct to restaurant. Uh, but most of the shellfish that we sell gets shipped out of state across the country uh, to most of the major, major markets, which is a wonderful thing to know that you could go to New York City and get fresh Rhode Island oysters on the raw bar there, let's say Grand Central Oyster Bar. Yeah, um, and they're so fresh. Absolutely and that, fresh. That's, that's the thing about it. And, and this seawater thing that you're doing with, with cleaning them out mm -hmm. uh, must make them very attractive it to is. the restaurants. and Because when they're opening them up and, and putting them out at their raw bars or putting them in their uh, pasta dishes, uh, the taste is there for a fresh fish. Absolutely, the seawater system allows us to market under our restaurant ready brand of shellfish. Uh, basically, as it gets to the restaurant, it's ready to go. Ready to and go. so that's what we market most of our shellfish under is our restaurant ready brand. Greg, what can you tell me about shellfish? We were talking earlier about uh, how it's a protein and uh, I'm not sure if a lot of people understand that compared to how a shellfish is different from other types of food. Sure. Well, shellfish, uh, they're a bivalve, they're a filter feeder, but uh, most importantly, they're very healthy for you. Um, actually, uh, from what I've learned, mussels have uh, more protein per ounce than steak. So you're eating a much healthier lean protein when you eat mussels as opposed to steak. So there's essential vitamins and minerals inside the oyster, and the best part about it is there's no calories. No calories. So it's really very healthy food. Unbelievably it's, healthy. It's clean food. It's fresh food. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it's it's local most of it's local you know we for the most part deal with uh, farmers and fishermen here in New England uh, we do import some products from Canada but we like to keep uh, our products as domestic as possible and as local as possible so we're actually uh, trying we are growing oysters here in Narragansett Bay and we're working on farming uh, mussels on a large scale here in, in Rhode Island how is the uh, shellfish in uh, New England or Rhode Island different from shellfish that that people harvest in other parts of the world? Well, what the beauty of shellfish um, is they kind of take on the characteristics of the water where they're growing. Okay. Uh, it's almost like wine, uh, where they call it terroir with wine uh, and yep. grape farmers. We call it merroir with different kinds of oysters and, and, and mussels and clams. So they'll take on the flavors of what the algae is that they're eating in the water there. Um, there's also different species of oysters, different species of mussels, so you're going to get different characteristics with the different species as well. So, oh, It's very interesting. You're working with harvesting your own products and developing oyster farms, mm -hmm. and now you're looking at developing uh, farms for harvesting mussels Right. also. So uh, is that um, that's something that's fairly new and different from what was done in the past? Well, I think there's just more uh, more people getting involved in the actual farming process of shellfish. Um, I know when we first started, we were one of the few uh, farms here in Rhode Island, and now every year there seems to be three or four small pop-up farms that uh, come up. Uh, the, what's great is the state of Rhode Island and the regulators have made it a, a much easier process now to go through and get all your permits to, to farm shellfish here in Rhode Island. Um, but what we're trying to do is we know there's an overpopulation problem in the world. So there, there's less places on land to farm uh, livestock, farm vegetables. Um, so we're looking at the ocean where it's kind of a open area. Nobody's really experimented with it. And uh, we feel that there's a future in growing sustainable proteins in open water and feeding the world. Yeah. And then we want to be on the forefront of that. And you also talked about uh, you're looking into uh, harvesting in deeper waters than than what people are currently doing. Right. To see how that works. Right. So as more farms pop up, small farms, we're actually already starting to see it in, in some of the salt ponds. Uh, there's just too many oysters for that area. And so we're looking uh, at areas in the open ocean uh, which are not used by commercial fishermen, which are not used by... Uh, you know, uh, deep water wind. 
Um, and so we're, uh, we're looking to areas where we might be able to grow sustainable proteins in the open ocean in the future um, that don't interfere with any of the other things that are going on in the ocean. Um, so my brother and I actually were in Washington, D.C. in March lobbying on behalf of the Northeast Regional Plan which basically mapped out all the different uses of the oceans here in New England. And now we know who's using what areas and we can go and focus on certain areas that aren't being used or maybe co-mingle with, let's say, deep water wind and string long lines and grow shellfish in between the windmills. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunity in the open ocean. And that's definitely what we're looking at for the future. You know, the, you, you look at even Long Island Sound in New York. I mean, the abundance of oysters there in the early 1900s was amazing. And just as people moved closer and wanted waterfront property, right. more stuff getting put into the ocean, like runoff of gasoline and stuff like that, you know, it just contributed to the natural oyster sets diminishing until a point where we're at now, where in, when I was a kid growing up in this company, uh, we used to bring in 10,000 local Rhode Island wild oysters a day. And it was amazing. And now I probably bought 800 pieces this year. There's just no wow. wild sets or the sets that are happening are in areas that are closed for pollution. Yeah, there's, there's been problems on and off with water pollution in the bay. And, but for the most part, the, the shellfish really do, seems like they do a good job at cleansing the water. Absolutely. And, and keeping the water. So this is a, a real good thing having people developing these farms in, in the uh, coastal waters here Absolutely. to cleanse our water. Yeah, it's definitely doing a great job in cleaning yeah. it up um, and, and eventually we're going to get to a point where we're going to need to to keep putting more and more shellfish in the water to keep it filtered. Oysters and, and mussels, they're a great natural filter feeder. It's wonderful. And so we have this resource here that can help us clean up our waters and it's just about uh, creating areas to put them in and finding places where we can have them grow and then eventually maybe we can get back to where we get these natural sets of, of wild oysters and mussels here in Rhode Island uh, but I think we have a little ways to go before we get there well at least it's a beginning and people seem to be doing a heck of a good job you have to start somewhere and uh, right. what's great is the the state of Rhode Island they're really big proponents of aquaculture. Uh, they know this is a, that the shellfish industry in Rhode Island is traditionally one of the strongest in the world and we want to keep it that way. And so uh, the government, DEM, they're really working hard with us to make sure that we can continue to have the best shellfish in the world out of Rhode Island.